This episode of Ragcast Outdoors is brought to you by PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Fish on! Hey, Radcast is on! Hunting, fishing, and everything in between. This is Radcast Outdoors. Here are David Merrill and Patrick Edwards. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Radcast Outdoors. I'm Patrick Edwards. Today I'm really excited because I get to have somebody on the show that I've been wanting to interview for a long time. When I first met him, it was back at iCast in 2011. We were just talking about that. And Doug Sane, you've been within Fisherman for 42 years, you said. Is that about right? Yeah, good morning, Pat. This will be the 42nd year and i started actually writing for in fisherman in 1977 so it's been a long time yeah well it's great to have you on the show and in fisherman's been a huge part of my life i i'm 38 and i think i started watching in fisherman videos probably when i was five or six i think i watched something about you know i think it was al lender and larry dahlberg doing a dahlberg diver thing with fly fishing and you know watching some of those shows back in the early days you know when we had them on vhs tapes and it's kind of a nostalgic right. part of my of my childhood. And then, of course, the magazine, which I've been getting for many years now. But in Fisherman, I think if you look at it, it's probably been a part of most anglers' lives at some point. Yeah, well, the Linders started in Fisherman in 1975. So Al and Ron, the famous brothers, of course. Ron passed away a couple of years ago now. But uh, Al's been, uh, well, they continued, and uh, I got to know them and started to write a column for them called the Bits and Pieces column, which was sort of a science-based column. So as I mentioned uh, at one point to you, I was a school teacher, a science teacher to begin with, and that's how I kind of got involved in the whole process uh, of trying to write to connect science-based stuff to fishing, and that's how I got to know the lenders. And when they had an editor quit in 1981, they asked me to be an editor. And so I moved to Brainerd, Minnesota after 10 years of teaching and coaching. And the rest is history. Uh, the lenders sold in Fisherman in 1998 and moved on and now do their own production thing still here in Brainerd, Minnesota. And in Fisherman has gone on to thrive ever since. So things have changed, certainly, as you said, where once there were four TV shows playing on national television, like on the Nashville channel, one of which was us. Now we have this plethora of YouTube stuff and other television channels and so on and so on. So yeah, things have really changed. Yeah. The fishing industry has changed a whole bunch. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today with selective harvest, fish care, all kinds of different things. But I want to kind of start with how did you get started in fishing? Tell me the story of when you were young how did you get involved in fishing, and what was it about it that kind of sparked your interest? Well, it's, it goes back so far that I really can't remember very many details, but I am told, uh, for example, that, um, so I grew up in Iowa, so not a lot of big-time lake fishing opportunities. We, we had sand pits, and we had a river called the Little Rock River that ran close to town about seven miles away, so that was catfishing. Uh, the Iowa Great Lakes were about 60 miles away, and those were beautiful glacial lakes. And so my grandparents and parents would uh, often take me fishing. So I'm told that I had a hankering or an aptitude for fish cleaning already by the time I was four. So we would catch bullheads uh, on vacation, and I would be standing there barebacked and mosquitoes on my back, a uh, light bulb over our heads trying to clean these bullheads. So <laughs> it goes back a long way. Yeah, and cleaning bullheads is not exactly a real fun activity, but you must have really enjoyed it to be in there doing it at that age. There's something about cleaning animals, the harvest, the whole connection. You know, I like I hunted for many, many years, elk in the mountains and uh, deer, of course. Uh, the, the whole connection to me, the hunter gathering is uh, pretty strong. I love to hunt for mushrooms and, you know, go out and gather those things. So something clicked in there a long time ago, and it's been ever since, so... 70 years. Yeah, that's great. I, you, when you were talking about that, I had this visualization in my mind of when my dad and I used to go catch, we have this little, it's, it's basically a pond. They call it a lake, but it's really a pond, but it's close to where I live. And 
uh, we would come up here to visit my grandparents and I would go out there and catch a whole bunch of these six to nine inch yellow perch. And we would, oh, yeah. we would spend hours cleaning those things. And, um, and then there was another lake close to where I lived at the time when I was growing up that had channel cats and we would catch like the, I don't know, they were 17 to 24 inches. And I remember my dad was from Texas. And so he taught me how to clean those things. And I was just fascinated with how different a channel cat was than a yellow perch, you know, <laughs> it's just like, man, these oh, things yeah. are totally different, but man, they were delicious. So it didn't matter. So who was your fishing mentor? Was it family growing up? Was it your grandparents? I mean, who, who kind of guided you along in your journey? Yeah, both, both parents and grandparents, they all fished. I would spend a lot of time with my grandparents. Uh, once they were both retired, they would <clears throat> drive us to these Iowa Great Lakes and uh, we didn't have a boat, you know, back then, but we had access to fishing off of docks. So you could go sit on a dock for a day and we'd catch perch and bullheads. And occasionally I'd hook into a northern pike or something like that. I learned uh, to fillet fish early on, too. You would catch uh, freshwater drum, the sheep's head. Mm-hmm. And that was a big enough, that was one of the few big enough fish that we caught uh, that, you know, could actually be filleted. So I learned that early on. And I had. I remember when I was uh, in junior high, I had a fish cleaning and bird cleaning service. We had a lot of pheasants and Hungarian partridge uh, when I was growing up. And so I would clean those for 25 cents a piece. And I don't remember what I charged for fish anymore. So, But I didn't have much of a fish cleaning business back then. But there was a lot of pheasants to be cleaned and that kind of thing. Yeah, pheasants are amazing to eat. I, I made a Hungarian paprikash with uh, some pheasant. It was probably a couple of months ago, you know, we did like a, uh, David and I did a late season cow elk hunt. And then when we were done doing that, there was like four or five days left in the pheasant season. We went and did some pheasant hunting and got some pheasants and there's not much better eating than a pheasant. That's for sure. And it's, it's cool to hear you talk about that and growing up, you know, hunting, gathering. I think that people who listen to this show have all that have that as kind of like a common thread. And I know, I think so, yeah. yeah. And I know like on your show, I've been watching it for years, but like a, a lot of times you like to put on the waders, go into these back creeks, fish for channel catfish and for uh, red horse suckers and things like that. And it, it just totally takes me back, you know, as a kid growing up here in Wyoming and doing that for brook trout and suckers and, um, you know, uh, not necessarily channel cats cause we don't have a lot of those here, but just kind of that, you know, get out there, get in the water, be a part of nature. And so can you talk a little bit about what that has meant to you, uh, you know, from the time you were little until now? Well, and it's also part and parcel of the fact that I, you end up liking to fish for everything. So you have opportunities for the channel cats, as you mentioned, and then in the ponds, there were bluegills and some largemouth bass, and yeah, but I, I've, I've always enjoyed shore casting for walleyes, too. That's some something that's very straightforward and easy, and so I would be coaching in the Iowa Great Lakes region, and after coaching either track or baseball or whatever, uh, I'd take off to the Iowa Great Lakes, and you could fish into the evening for three or four hours and then drive home. You'd be home at 11 o'clock eat a late lunch, get up to school the next day, and that was your lifestyle. Um, But the the connection to catfishing was sort of um, more intense a little bit for a long time than anything else, simply because there there was really no connection to, there there were a lot of catfishermen, you know, like 7 million in the surveys, and yet no one was addressing this gigantic market, and it was thought to be like a crude sport, you know, and that kind of thing, and it wasn't, of course. There was all these active people doing what you're talking about doing uh, all across the country. There's, I think, channel catfish in 41 of the 50 states, Uh, so they're very accessible. Uh, It's very rare across the country, well, across all of North America, not to have a stream relatively close by. You you might have brook trout like you're talking about or cutthroats or, you know, whatever, but catfish are very accessible, and so... The little river that was north of the town where I grew up, uh, that became a place where I spent a lot of time, obviously. So we could ride our bike, be there in about half hour, you know, seven miles down a gravel road, uh, and then you'd spend the day there. 
And of course, uh, that's often talked about these days where in those days you left the house at some point and you didn't get back until dark and nobody thought anything about it. And uh, so there are all these great adventures that kids can't quite participate in quite so easily as we did probably. Yeah. I was thinking about my dad and I, we, you know, he is from Texas, so he liked channel cats and there was a place north of Cheyenne about an hour and a half hour, hour and a half drive. And we would do that throughout the summer just to go sit by the lake. It was just this really tiny, it was probably only, gosh, they called it rock Lake, but it was probably only about four acres. It was pretty small and they had cattails and it was like the perfect habitat for channel catfish and they'd put channel cats in there. So we'd take, you know, just a slip bobber rig and, you know, some kind of, right. a, some kind of a cut bait or, you know, something stinky, <laughs> you know, put on there and we'd catch a limit of channel cats and just had a great time. I mean, it's it, the, the only, the only drawback was the horse flies, but you know, that's just kind of part of fishing. Oh, yeah. So, but we, we had a really good time doing that growing up and yeah, channel cats are just an amazing fish. They're a lot of fun. And you'd mentioned drum earlier. I think channel cats, drum, carp, a lot of those fish get kind of a bad rap and, and it kind of drives me crazy because people don't realize that drum are actually really good to eat. Um, and you know, it, it's unfortunate that some of these fish kind of get that stigma, I guess. And so why do you think that is, why do you think that the rough, the, you know, the, I'm putting that in air quotes, but the, like the rough fish, why do they get such a bad rap? Boy, I don't know. We've spent the majority of the time at in fishermen trying to dispel those kinds of, uh, thinking that kind of thinking. And that's why I'm mentioning you know, when you come to a magazine, we've had so many other lenders have their own philosophy about doing these things. And but when I came, then I brought my love of catfishing uh, along with me, as well as my love of ice fishing. And I had a love of passion to catch carp and that kind of thing. So that all became part and parcel of what we were teaching at In Fisherman. So it was just an extension, a further extension of this uh, multi-species uh, type of, of bent where. We wanted to have people thinking about fishing for not just the game fish or sport fish species, as they were often called, uh, but all manner of fish, including, so we, we always say we love them all. We want to be able to understand them and catch them all. And that goes for carp and suckers, and whatever you name. Um, if we had more magazine pages, we'd be talking about all of those things, every magazine issue, but we don't have those kind of pages. So we kind of redirect things to the more popular species, which are large mouse and small mouse. And we do do uh, a catfish article every time and panfish articles. And then we write about drum and whatever else when we have a chance, the opportunity to, but they're all of these fish are worth pursuit. Yeah. They're all wonderful fish. When you're talking about eating fish, that's one of the cool things about eating fish too. Um, if you take care of them wisely, they, you, you begin to notice how differently some of them taste. And some people don't like that, but other people like myself, for example, I relish the fact that uh, drum tastes a little bit different than white bass, tastes a little bit different than walleye, tastes a little bit different than pike, and so on. So this is one of the great things about being able to catch fish and keep them. Yeah, and I think in fishermen's a big reason that I'm a multi-species nut. I don't just focus on one thing. I, I see a lot of anglers in kind of my sphere of this state that are there's the really hardcore trout guys and that's what they yeah. focus on. Then there's the really hardcore lake trout guys. And I do put those in different categories cause they are very different. And then you have your hardcore walleye anglers and then there's kind of everybody else, you know, kind of whatever you do. And so I remember a couple of years ago I had had Jim Zumbo on the podcast and we were talking about suckers and I, you know, growing up in Cheyenne, we had small red horse suckers that were close and I could go down to this little creek that ran through town and I could catch those. And there's a spot on the Wind River that I knew there were bigger white suckers. Well, and and yeah. so I went there thinking, man, the state record's only 21 inches. I bet I can beat that. And I ended up getting the state record sucker out of there. There's, yeah. you know, but no one no one goes for them and people were kind of critical like well why would you even go after a sucker it's like well why wouldn't you go after a sucker and right. you know i 
I pickled some and, you know, tried, I made fish patties with some and I mean, they're actually really, really good to eat, but people just kind of, they're like, ah, oh, but they look funny or they, you know, I, I can't imagine even trying that. And it's just kind of, it's kind of maddening sometimes. And like drum, you talked about, they have a flavor that's, it's different, but they have more oil in them and they taste, I think they taste really good, but there's, there's lots of great opportunities for anglers, but you mentioned something just a minute ago that I want to jump into and that's fish care. Fish care is to me, it's a, it's a critical thing and it's something I didn't do well for a number of years. So let's say you're, you're catching catfish in a back Creek. What is the absolute best way to care for that fish so that you get the, the best flavor from them when you go to prepare them later? Okay. Well, the gold standard as now determined by whatever means, well, the gold standard for fish care is a process, a Japanese fish kill method called Aikijimi. Now, this is going to go over a lot of people's head, but uh, we've talked about it now in the magazine, and it's actually an ancient technique. And it, there's also now an Aikijimi federation that has come to be in the last couple of years. So Aikijimi, first of all, you spell it like I-K-E, so Aiki. Jimmy is G-I-M-E, Aikijimi. So it's a Japanese word for a process uh, of catching fish quickly, first of all. But that's rarely a problem with, like, if you're talking about catfish or any of the freshwater fish. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they are big enough to fight that hard, we normally would release them anyway. So you catch fish as quickly as you can. Then you kill them immediately. There's no on the stringer, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not saying that that's absolutely wrong because that's the way we do it sometimes and have to do it sometimes. But the best possible thing to do is to kill the fish immediately by spiking the brain of the fish. So you have a fish spike. And so the brain is right in back of the eyes by about an inch on the catfish. The spike is just a short, it could be a short uh, fillet knife. You know, that would work too. But the spike for the Aikijimi process is important because when the spike goes into the brain, so envision the sharp tool now, uh, and you've got hold of one end that's a little bit wider than the spike, of course. So back of the eyes, about an inch, you take the spike and at about a 30 degree angle, this goes into the fish's skull and it's not that difficult at all. This goes into the fish's brain and as soon as it hits the fish's brain, the fish shudders and then it goes still. And then you take the tool further and open up the brain cavity just a little bit more by wiggling around the spike. Then the spike is withdrawn. And in the true Aikijimi process, now you take a wire, a thin, specially made wire that then is inserted into this hole that goes into the brain. And at the back of the brain is the spinal, not the column, but the spinal uh, canal. And this wire is inserted then into this canal and it goes down below the back or the with, along the backbone down the spinal canal all the way to the fish's tail. And as you're doing this, the fish is work, wiggling and what you're doing is you're destroying all neural signaling to the muscles, which shuts down some difficult to explain chemical processes, which is why, which causes fish not to go into rigor uh, quite so intensely. So this was all sounding probably a little bit strange, but so far what we've done is we've caught the fish quickly. We've killed him immediately, or killed it immediately. Uh, we've destroyed the neural processes by destroying the brain and the uh, spinal cord. And now the next part is to immediately bleed the fish. So to bleed a fish, you can either cut through the uh, is isthmus at the bottom below the gills, you can cut right through that. It's a little thin connection connecting the gills to the collar of the fish, and then back of that is the heart. So what you're going to want to do is you want to sever the vessels leading from the heart to the gills. So you can do it like doing like that. You can sever the gills themselves, or there's thin tissue in the collar of the fish right in back of the gills. You can insert a knife there and cut in there. And even though the fish is dead, uh, there's enough blood pressure that the fish will bleed out. So we've killed or we've uh, caught the fish quickly. Uh, we've done the Aikijimi thing with the brain spike to kill the fish quickly. 
then you bleed the fish. The, the fish bleeds out relatively quickly. You can put the fish in a live well. You can lay it on the grass. Uh, it doesn't take long. And then finally, after this has all been done, you wipe the fish off. And the best possible thing to do at that point is to put the fish into uh, an ice slurry. So that's some ice cubes, some shaved ice along with water. And instead of a hard cooler, I've started to use fish kill bags, which are now, they weren't very common until about two years ago, but now they're very common. So they're soft-sided bags. And um, you've got that filled with ice and a little bit of water, and the fish goes into there. The fish is now laying straight. So that gets you into the process. That's the gold standard for fish care. Now, I'm not insisting that everybody's going to want to do that, and half the people that hear this for the first time are going to think this is the craziest thing in the world, but that's the gold standard. Now, can we do that all the time? Of course not. Um, and so at some point, you may have to use a stringer, or you may want to use a. For years, I used a fish basket when I walked those creeks, uh, just a wire fish basket. And so there's you've got a gold standard, and then you've got all of the other things that – you may have to uh, compromise. So the talk about some of the benefits on the, on the cleaning end, you know, the quality of the meat and the consumptive part, what, what difference does it make? Cause I know some people are going to be listening to this and they're like, yeah, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But in your experience, what is the difference that it makes? Well, when fish go into rigor, they stiffen up just as a game animal does, you know, as a game animal, um, the best practice is to kill it. And again, if you were killing a game animal, you want to kill it as cleanly and quickly as possible. You don't want to run the animal. When you're doing the Aikijimi thing, you're ultimately trying to re totally reduce stress. The more stress, the more lactic acid, the more rigor you're going to have. And rigor is what causes the problem. So in a game animal, you're going to want to typically hang the animal so the animal will go into rigor and then as it's hanging, of course, it's got to be in the right temperature. The, the animal will come out of rigor, and then you can clean it. You don't want to clean the animal when it's in rigor because then the muscles shorten up and the animal gets uh, very tough. Well, it's the same process, basically, with fish. If you do the Aikijimi thing, you totally reduce stress, and the fish doesn't go into this intense rigor. And it comes out of the rigor very, or not quickly, but so it goes into rigor slowly, it doesn't go into intense rigor, and it comes out slowly. The main difference that happens here is that when you do that, fish, you know, we've all been taught that one of the most important things is to chill fish quickly and keep them chilled. That's fine as long as the fish doesn't go into this extreme rigor. So typically, I mean, I, one of the worst things I think you can do with fish is to catch them, and then in the summertime, you just throw them into a cooler with ice in it. So the fish is flopping around. Uh, that's stressful. The fish is having, it takes a while for the fish to die because it's got to, you know, it's going to eventually not get enough oxygen. So that's, ex you know, extending the stress time. And then you're not doing anything. You're not bleeding the fish. Uh, you're not killing it immediately. And so most people will recognize what happens to these fish. They contort and the fish are half bent, and when you take them out of the cooler and then to clean them, you've got to bend them back straight in again, and that causes gapping in the flesh, or it rips flesh when you do that, and it causes flesh to be softer. It'll have less texture, uh, and it often will not taste like it should. So the amazing thing with the Aikijimi thing process is that if you do that properly, fish won't go into rigor very deeply. It'll come out quickly. And you can actually, we've always been telling people in the past, and, you know, I didn't do this right either for many, many years, but we, we would say you can only, you know, you can't keep fish for five days. You know, even if you keep it at the right temperature, it's not going to keep very well. Well, the reason it's not keeping very well is because it hasn't been treated well to begin with. If you do the Aikijimi thing, you actually will have fish that will gain in flavor, just like you age your your venison, uh, after it's if it's been properly taken care of, it will gain a depth of flavor uh, that wasn't there before, uh, and that same thing can now happen with fish. So, fish that we used to think we had to eat within three days can now set, but it's got to be in cold temperatures. Can now set uh, for three or four or five or six or even seven days, and it will actually gain in flavor. 
in many instances, so or it will attain a depth of flavor. Eating fish as in cooked in a immediate shore lunch is always going to be an awesome thing, I think. Now, some fish can be tough in that instance, but most people don't seem to notice it one way or another. But uh, that's not necessarily the best way and the most tasteful way to have fish. It often tastes better. It certainly cooks up better like three days afterwards after it's come out of rigor. So it's a long sort of complicated process where you've got to explain this and then you've got to explain that. And, and then I think the next question probably from you would be, well, are you going to be able to taste the difference? And I would say, yes, uh, the texture is going to be better and the taste is going to be better and more distinctive. But I would also have to admit that some cooking methods uh, tend to make that um, sort of the great, you know, I mean, deep fried fish, that's sort of the great equalizer for you're not probably going to be able to, at least most people, and taste is a very selective, uh, subjective thing anyway. So there's certainly going to be people that aren't going to be able to tell one way or another, I'm afraid. Yeah, there's a lot of people that just say, well, I don't like fish. And I, I've I've met a lot of those. They'll come to my house for a fish fry, and they're like, "Well, is there anything else? I don't like fish." And then they leave the house saying, "I like fish." I mean, it just you know, a, a lot right. of people just haven't had quality fish, and that's that's the difference in you know their thinking. So this brings another question because I see this all the time: is ice fishing? A lot of guys they'll pull their fish through the ice. They'll unhook them and they'll throw them over on the side and they just lay there. Talk about ice fishing care because it's, it's a little different than if it's in the summer. You know, if it's in the summer, I can have, you know, the soft side or hard sided cooler with a slurry. I can go through that whole method. Ice fishing, it's just a little bit different. So talk about why maybe it's not a good idea to just throw them up on the ice and have them freeze solid. Because here in Wyoming, especially where I live, it happens really quickly. But what what, yeah. what does that do to the meat? Well, the first part of the answer would be to never let your fish freeze because frozen fish, the cells burst, and then when you unfreeze them to clean them, there's all this ooziness that comes out of them, and you're losing texture and flavor once again. So you never want to let your fish freeze. And the other thing would be is that you don't want to let your fish just suffocate. That's stressful. And you're trying to reduce this stress factor once again to ensure the quality of the catch. So you need to kill these fish when they come out immediately. And the best way to do that is the Ikejimi process that I just mentioned uh, with the fish spike. Um, or, I mean, there's other ways to kill fish. You can bonk them on the head. The problem with the bonking is then you don't have a way to do the uh, wire. But most people probably aren't going to do the wire anyway. Uh, you know, I admit that the gold standard is the gold standard, but we've got the practices that most people do that we can improve on. And immediate killing and bleeding is the main thing for ice fishing, just as it would be, you know, on open, you know, for open water situations. So kill the fish immediately. Like you can take a perch and you can, um, you know, just take the head and hold it in the body and lift up on the head and you kill the fish immediately by breaking its neck or that, you know, part of the backbone right there. So that's a start. You still got enough blood pressure to bleed the fish. So the, the method that I mentioned, either cut through the isthmus, cut the gills, or cut back that soft tissue in back of the, uh, the collar of the fish. The best method, I think, is to do that soft tissue in the back of the collar because then you never have any trouble on, you know, like on some walleye fisheries, you've got a length limit. And if you cut through that isthmus, I think game wardens are going to have a problem with trying to... Um, measure the fish appropriately so back to your question on ice kill the fish immediately bleed it immediately put it into either a soft-sided bag or a hard-sided cooler with a little snow make sure that it does not freeze if it takes putting it in the back of your suburban you know the the soft-sided cooler you know do that or the hard-sided cooler so that's the essence of what you would need to do on the ice because I, I don't think that's a widely held thing i mean just from my experience you know i'll, I'll be out at the reservoir and you'll see somebody they'll have a, a stack of you know frozen fish <laughs> you know these trout right. that uh, you know i'm like man when you get that home to your point it's gonna be mushy you lose the texture for sure and the flavor and it's just not going to be as good and i think that's part of the reason that a lot of people don't like fish is that's that's what they get and it's all about taking care of it and 
stewarding that resource, not just as, you know, we try to steward and take care of our lakes, but also taking care of what we harvest to ensure that it's the best quality that we can for our friends and family when we take it home. Um, Absolutely. So just a question here that we ask all the guests, what's your favorite fish to eat, Doug? Like over the years, you know, freshwater fish wise, what's your favorite one to take home and eat? Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I th- I'm saying that the, if you handle these fish correctly, the really nice thing is that they are all, in their own unique way, wonderful to taste, test, and eat. So bluegills taste nutty to me. They're sweet and nutty, mm-hmm. and they taste like uh, sort of taste like largemouth bass. Largemouth bass taste like bluegills to me when they're handled nicely. Beautiful, flaky, white flesh. Bluegills are wonderful. Crappies are wonderful. Uh, but they taste different than bluegills. And, of course, perch are much different. Uh, many people love love perch, you know, have a love affair mm-hmm. with eating perch. And walleyes are wonderful. They're flaky, but they're very mild. Uh, northern pike is much more distinctive and a lot. Uh, it has a different texture. And pike are well known for feeding on such a variety of things that in different bodies of water, they often take uh, take on a different taste. So, for example, we go to Devil's Lake, and on Devil's Lake, there's all these freshwater shrimp, and the pike will be not only eating some of these freshwater shrimp, but, but they'll be eating fish. They're eating these shrimp. And so you'll find that the pike there take on an almost yellowish, orangish uh, look to their flesh, mm-hmm. and they taste just robustly different than pike that come from other waters. So you get that with a lot of, a lot of fish. Um, you know, you, you experience that with trout. You know, obviously, if you eat, I take a, a hatchery raised trout, and um, if you know if it's been stocked and you catch it, it tastes a lot different than a wild, you know, a trout. So, but that's for me handling fish, and you don't need that much. You know, I mean, a six ounce portion or an eight ounce portion of fish flesh is enough if you've got it going alongside of other things. So, if you start to take on that mentality that you don't need. A ton of fish, you just need to take care of it appropriately. Uh, then when you get it to the table, you know, you're going to be able to notice the taste difference. And so it, your original question was, what, what do I, which one do I like best? And then the answer is, I simply like to eat them all. And I enjoy the fact that they taste differently. Oh, I think that's a perfect answer. I like different fish for different reasons. I always tell people I like pike because I like the texture and the flavor of a pike. People think I'm yep. crazy because if you were to fry up walleye and pike and put them in front of me and they're both handled appropriately, I'm probably going to take the pike just because I'd like the texture better. It's mm-hmm. just more of a steak kind of a, you know, consistency yep. to it. I, I just really, really enjoy that. Um, and then like smoked fish and there's lots of different good ones. You know, I, people think that I'm crazy for this, but smoked mountain white fish and grayling. I'll take that usually over a lot of the trout species or, you know, well, they're, they're, they're buddies in the same species, but you know, like over like a rainbow trout or, or something like that, I would much right. rather have a grayling or a mountain white fish just because of the flavor profile is a little different. Um, but, yeah. I think the white fish are the gold standard of smoking. Oh, oh they're so smoking. good. Yeah. They're yep. amazing. Aren't they? I mean, Ed, you know, again, that's another fish that a lot of people look at and they're like, ah, why would you eat that? It's like, Man, you're missing out. That's like one of the best fish you can eat. Yeah, and high in omega threes, they're just wonderful. Yeah, and I I think they're fun to catch, but uh, I also like catching grayling. They 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 fight really hard, and they're gorgeous too. Um, and a lot of our high mountain lakes here have tons and tons and tons of them. So you know they're fun mm-hmm. to catch and they're plentiful. Um, but I want to kind of piggyback on something you said because you talked about eating largemouth bass i remember when i was a kid we would catch when we were catching yellow perch every once in a while we'd catch you know largemouth bass and we would bring whatever the regulation was we could bring one home and we would eat those and nowadays it seems like it's almost like you get shunned if you touch (laughs) a largemouth bass and i just don't understand where that comes from where does that come from? You know, it's changed for sure over the last 30 years. Yeah. The, um, so I lived through all of this and it takes a long time sometimes for change to take place. So, um, or not all of it. I didn't live through all of it, but so 
I think the first utterance of catch and release was from Lee Wolf, the famous old school fly fisherman. I think that was 1936. And then by 1971-72 in there, the Bass Angler Sportsman Society had begun, and they were uh, proposing a don't kill your catch uh, program. And I think that wasn't so much a conservation thing with, uh, if you knew Ray Scott, he was a big time promoter, um, wanted this, uh, the best thing to take off, and it, it did. Uh, but I think it wasn't so much a conservation thing about releasing the catch or releasing these tournament catches so much as it was the pushback that he was getting for all of these stringers of bass being drugged across the stage to be weighed. But that started the whole process in the bass world. And uh, then a little bit more slowly in the multi-species world that I was part of at In Fisherman, uh, when I came to In Fisherman in 1980, um, they were still having, we still had some stringer shots inside the magazine and then catch and release started to really catch on. But once, so there was this time period in the 1980s where catch and release caught on so intensely that what you're describing became very common. Instead of harvesting fish selectively, uh, you didn't, ha- they, people weren't harvesting any fish at all. Um, you didn't kill bass. It was a sacrilege to kill a bass. And so what we proposed in about the late 1980s was a selective harvest concept. And so this was a lot more nuanced than just a knee-jerk reaction to every time you catch a fish, you have to release it. So it made sense to us to suggest that uh, fish are nutritious. So this is what the selective harvest principle is. Fish are nutritious and they're delicious. And when they're harvested wisely, they're a renewable resource. So we release the bigger fish, the less abundant fish, to bolster fish stocks and to sustain good fishing while we harvest the more abundant smaller fish, not only to balance out fish populations, but to continue a tradition of eating fish. That's a long-standing tradition. It's a great tradition, and it makes sense because it was now saying, if you harvest the right fish, uh, they're a renewable resource. So with bass, uh, you know, 12 to 14-inch bass are wonderful to, on the table. Uh, they get a little coarse if you're trying to eat bigger fish, but then you don't want to eat the bigger ones anyway because we want to release those to sustain good fishing. So that, in a nutshell is the concept of selective harvest. So that's what we've always promoted. And that is widely caught on now across the country. A lot of uh, fisheries departments use it uh, in their literature. Uh, and it makes, just makes common sense. So <clears throat> what you were getting at with the bath certainly did occur, but uh, we started, we did what we could to try and ne- negate that with this selective harvest principle. Right. Yeah, I, I caught a lot of flag personally for harvesting some grayling and doing some smoked grayling. And, you know, I was in a body of water where the biologists and fisheries managers are like, please take some because there's too many. Absolutely. There, I, I think it's interesting if you see the evolution of this over the years that, you know, there's there's the, the people I would say are really hardcore catch and release only. And then you have the hardcore catch and keep everything and then there's a lot of us that are kind of in the middle of that bell curve somewhere and uh you know i it's interesting because people say well you shouldn't you shouldn't keep anything you should release everything but if everybody did that in a lot of our reservoirs and in a lot of our streams and lakes it they would overpopulate and then we would have other issues of stunted growth and you know it, it it's it's just like the you know, North American conservation model for hunting and harvesting, selectively harvesting, like you're talking about the right animals on the hunting side, it applies directly over to fishing because like I have uh, a friend at tribal game and fish here, we're right in the middle of a reservation and they have a, a reservoir that is full of lake trout and they really need the pup lake trout taken out because it's, they've just taken over. And so you have a lot of these skinny lake trout swimming around and I mean, right. you can catch hundreds of them in a day that are 18 to 24 inches long. And those are good fish to eat. There's absolutely nothing yep. wrong with taking them home and smoking them. I mean, it, you talk about omega threes, 
those things are full of them and they're delicious. So it's just, it's, it's hard for me to watch like in the industry and how things have changed because it's almost like we, we have this attitude of demonizing people for keeping fish, which I think to your point, selective harvest. And I learned about selective harvest from in fishermen is that the beauty of it, like you said, it's all about sustaining the fishery and still doing, you know, what I feel like we're designed and built to do, which is to go out, hunt, gather fish, you know, get, get resources. That's part of what I love about the outdoors is I can go up into the mountains. I can catch brook trout. I can pick up porcini mushrooms, you know, uh, go up and shoot a grouse. And then I've, I've got the grand slam of the wind river mountains, you know? So, um, well said. Yes. Yeah. I think those are the kind of things that we should be thinking about. And I don't know. I, I see the industry even on, you know, it doesn't matter where you look, there is just kind of this tug of war between anglers over this issue. And I like that in fisherman has kind of, you know, over the years come in and said, Hey guys, let's look at this through a scientific perspective of how do we manage our resources and be good stewards of what we have so that it gets better and better over time. And so, you know, how many years have you guys been talking about selective harvest? It's been a long time. Yeah. I I wouldn't remember the exact year, but it would be the late 1980s. So probably 88, um, 87 in there. So that's when the first proposal was made. Uh, We've done, you know, lots of television shows and so on. And so, but what you were, you said that was perfectly said by me, wonderfully said and uh, applied to across the board to everything that we're bringing to the table, whether it be hunting or uh, fishing. And on the fishing side, it's things too, you know, like on the hunting side, you often talk about having the right genes to produce big animals and our healthy animals. And it works the same way with fishing. There, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that um, the reproduction of the larger fish, um, you know, is genetically a good thing. So there's another, you know, when you say you release the right fish to bolster fish stock, uh, that goes right along with the fact that now these fish can also be caught and caught or released and caught again. So uh, kind of a roundabout way of yeah. trying to improve fish stock. Yeah, they're, the fish biologists here were telling me that some of these big lake trout in like Flaming Gorge and Bull Lake and Jackson Lake, you know, once they hit, I think it was like the th- 38, 40 inches, something like that, that they're 50 years old, 60 years old. I mean, they're, they've been a resource right. in that reservoir for a really, really long time. And it's like, you know, those are ones that should probably stay there. Um, and yeah. you think about how many spawns they've gone through and, you know, just all of the things that they've been through in their life. It's like, yeah, that, that makes sense to put that back because especially in Wyoming, it takes forever to grow a fish just because of how, brutal the conditions are um a lot of times yeah. so uh, like growing a tree tree in the mountain yeah exactly yeah it takes it takes forever and like you know boysen reservoir here we've got crappie that are you know 15 inches long and those wow. fish are extremely old i mean really really old fish so um i think that that's an important thing to for people to keep in mind uh when they're out there harvesting or not harvesting, you know, depending on, depending on what they do, but just to kind of segue and talk about stewardship and future of fishing, what are, what are some things that, you know, you see as important to sustaining fishing into the next 15, 20 years? Well, just what we're talking about would be certainly one of the main things. So the selective harvest of fish, a movement towards a thinking where, you don't have, you know, it's not, I have to have the 25 cropping limit or I'm not happy. Uh, I can be happy with five or 10 if they're treated appropriately and then they're cooked appropriately on the table. So that's one important aspect. Uh, everything that we do, hunting or fishing, always comes back to resting on the, ha- you know, having habitat. Uh, so that never goes away. And um, I don't know the answers to climate change and that kind of thing, but that's an important you know, important impacting the West right now in terms of drought and and so on. And so we're going to have to have a a look at that and see what we can do there because it's part and parcel of uh, maintaining habitat, which is the key to wildlife abundance. You know, the Clean Water Act, I I lived through that. 1972 was uh, the Clean Water Act. 
that had a major impact on how clean our, you know, Lake Erie got cleaned up. The waters that we, you know, the in fisherman office sets on the upper, on the banks of the upper Mississippi River. I can look out the window and see the, the Mississippi running right by me now, heading towards Louisiana. And um, so a wonderful spot to have an office for sure. I can go out and catch fish right in the backyard here. But uh, that has been cleaned up immensely over the years. So fish populations have, by and large, actually, in many cases, improved simply because of some of the things like that, of you know, conservation-wise, that we've had the uh, foresight to, uh, you know, improve on. As far as getting kids involved in fishing, what are some things that you think are really important to teach kids and maybe some ways to get them interested in angling so that we have more kids you know coming up and fishing into the future you know that's an old one for in fishermen because when i got to in fishermen in 81 they asked me to go because i had been a teacher to go see a fishing camp that was being run as a camp for kids it was called camp fish so i went and looked at it and it was an amazing place kids could uh, you know they had to pay a fee but it wasn't exorbitant and they'd go and spend a week or two weeks at this camp with uh, these highly skilled instructors, uh, dedicated instructors, and it was so. That, so this was kind of like the perfect environment, but it was also one of those things that wasn't sustainable because there's not a lot of money in kids. Um, uh, <clears throat> so it's you know very difficult to sustain some of these things. But we help create government programs uh, that would uh, teach fishing sort of in the in fisherman um, perspectives. So you would teach kids about the nature of fish and then you know they that affects their location and that kind of thing so i don't really have an answer there except that everybody's got to be involved uh every local organization that does a kids fishing day you know all of these things come together to have an impact and then i think the what we're you're doing and what we're doing have an impact in that you know i can't i don't really have time to do all of the kids fishing events but i think that i'm doing my part by writing by directing these people to write these magazines and this enthusiasm that's you know comes from reading this material i think spurs other people to then get involved and help kids and so the podcast that you're doing these things all feed this big lake uh that's out there that is the sustenance of fishing as we know it no i think that's perfect it's it's, and it's a group effort like all of us are involved in in helping you know sustain fishing into the future we all have to be smart about it and we all have to make sure that we take our kids take our friends you know and and teach them and kind of guide them along and in fishermen's certainly been a key part of that so you know just thank you for all that you've done for me i mean i've i've been reading the magazine for many many years and i'll continue to read it and uh i love the show too you know watching on uh youtube and tv and so again i just want to say thank you so much for coming on to the to the podcast today this has been something i've wanted to do for quite a while now and so i really appreciate you taking the time i know you've got other things to go do but um if anybody wanted to learn more, what's the best thing that they can do as far as um, from in fishermen and from learning from you guys? Well, in fishermen, um, you know, is on newsstands. So if you're interested, obviously you can get a subscription. Uh, for a lot of what we've been talking about, as far as gold standard for keeping the catch, we do some fishing guides each year too. So we have a walleye guide that's quite popular that is actually hitting newsstands today. And so if you check uh, for the 2023 In Fisherman Walleye Guide, there's an article on gold standard for keeping in the catch in there. Joel Nelson wrote it uh, using me as the expert witness, so to speak. So not only will you learn about how to catch some walleyes for this season, but um, uh, you'll learn about this gold standard fish scare stuff too. You can see us on TV, and I very much thank you for uh, the invitation. It was fun. Yeah, it's always great to talk, and I'm glad we actually got to spend a little bit more time and in, in talking about things I'm really passionate about, which is you know the selective harvest, the fish care, and appreciating all the species. So again, thanks for coming on, and everybody, if you want more information, again, go to In Fisherman's website. You can check them out on the socials as well, but Yeah, thanks, Doug. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks again for listening to the Radcast Outdoors podcast. We hope that you've enjoyed the show. 
If so, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast and subscribe, share, and give us a five-star rating, which really helps other people find the show. You can find all of our shows, recipes, giveaways, videos, and much more at ragcastoutdoors.com. While you're there, please help support the show by purchasing a Radcast Outdoors shirt or hat. Please don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We also have a Radcast community on Facebook called Radcast Nation, and we'd love for you to join in the conversation there. And of course, please help support our sponsors who make this show possible. Thank you again to PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Until next time, get out there and enjoy the outdoors.